Okay, thanks a lot for having the opportunity tonight to discuss with you the problems and issues that uh, sovereigns face, and particularly in Europe, obviously, we have uh, some issue with creditworthiness of sovereigns and this spreading towards banks and, uh, and, and uh, markets in general. Um, I entitled my presentation European sovereigns um, living on borrowed time. So um, we feel that there is a need for sovereigns to address the issues that, uh, that came apparent in the last two to three years. And um, I organize my notes uh, as follows. I, first, I will give a bit uh, of a historic, um, uh, historic setting to compare the current crisis with debt levels that we had before uh, with uh, sovereigns. And we will see that it's not entirely unprecedented what we see these days in terms of debt to GDP, for instance. But uh, at the same time, there are some differences from past um, phases uh, of, uh, of very high debt. Um, the long term has become much nearer. I think this is key that uh, we have these rapidly increasing debt to GDP levels and at the same time we have the medium to long term challenges, particularly uh, costs that are related to aging. And so these future challenges in a way hit us now even earlier than, uh, uh, than uh, it was the case before this global crisis hit public debt levels. Um, the exit path, um, for us as a rating agency, it's quite obvious that uh, the, uh, I mean, many countries now need an exit plan from the fiscal stimulus and from the increase in, in debt to GDP that we just saw. And at the end, I want to give you an update on triple A, on our views on triple A's. Uh, some of you may be aware that uh, since last year we publish on a quarterly basis our AAA sovereign monitor because, I mean, this is one of the key questions that in investors ask us, are these AAAs to stay or when will you move towards AA uh, with your ratings? And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Ireland was a AAA before the crisis and, uh, and we decided to move the rating down uh, quite uh, on a measured pace, just one notch, but uh, uh, it's a double, uh, double A, one negative. Okay, so let me start um, um, with, this time is different. I mean, you could argue it's worse for several reasons and uh, what's really interesting and what makes our job very difficult is that uh, some of this, the, the considerations and, and in a way uh, the assumptions that we had prior to the crisis uh, prove to be challenged by this crisis. And, 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 and one, of the, um, uh, one of the assumptions that we had before is that economic strength is key, GDP per capita is key, rich countries are very, very, very unlikely to default. And uh, uh, we had the case of Iceland, which where the sovereign has not defaulted, but in a way it's, uh, it's the feeling was like a sovereign default, at least, at least to many uh, investors there. And we have now uh, the case of Greece, which has not defaulted either. But obviously there are serious issues, and if you look at just GDP per capita, which used to be a very good explanatory variable in economic models, for instance, to explain sovereign ratings, uh, to explain uh, the, the probability of default. So obviously something is changing currently. So which governments cannot default? It's not that clear anymore. Which governments are price constrained, not liquidity constrained? We uh, have discussions whether Greece obviously was not able anymore to finance itself on the markets and now uh, there are concerns regarding Spain, which is a rich country. Um, and governments with long-term solvency problems have time to address those problems. Obviously there's a, a linkage between solvency issues and liquidity issues. And uh, prior to this crisis, for 
investment grade rated countries, liquidity concerns were no issue. It was about solvency. And now liquidity issues are for investment grade uh, countries uh, a real issue. And that makes, yeah, m makes the job of assessing creditworthiness even more difficult. Um, the rise in public debt is unprecedented, and I go to the, um, uh, the next slide. It was triggered by, in a way, a series of crises that uh, we saw. The first stage of this series of crises was the financial crisis, which started in 2007. Economic growth was still fine in 2007, but then uh, the uh, the worsening conditions on financial markets had their impact on the real economy, so economic crisis followed. Um, and now we are in the middle of a public debt crisis. And this public debt crisis is here to stay for quite a while because we have um, uh, this sequence of increase in debt due to support for banking system, for instance, and uh, the widening of the structural deficits because Revenues declined, but expenditures did obviously not decline with economic activity going down. And, uh, and then uh, in a few years, these age-related costs are kicking in. So we have actually two public debt crises, the imminent one and the one that's uh, looming in the near future. OK, this is just. So actually charts from the Financial Times, which show, I mean, at first sight, they're pretty reassuring. I mean, this is, uh, if you take the UK, for instance, I mean, this is a quite lengthy time frame here. We start in the 17th century, but if you take this very long perspective, it um, doesn't look that special on what the debt levels that we have currently. And, and for the US, Looks not, look, I mean, it's uh, quite high debt level for a non war time, but still, it's not unprecedented. But what makes us concerned is that the environment is different. And I will explain that um, uh, in a few minutes. First, um, also reassuring is that. Rich countries in the past have been able to lower debt to GDP, to lower interest payment to revenue. So it's not, I mean, the exercise can be, these charts suggest this exercise can be done. It's, uh, there is hope. <laughs> and uh, what do we see here? Um, I mean, this is key to Moody's approach. Uh, in the public debate, the focus is very much on debt to GDP. The Maastricht criteria is defined in terms of debt to GDP. Debt to GDP is in the news, is in the press, it's discussed by investors. But if you look at um, uh, what countries defaulted in the past, we found that it's not so much debt to GDP that explains the default of countries. It's more interest payment to revenues. In a way, the, the really the burden of the debt. What, to what extent do you have to spend your revenues just in order to pay interest on the existing debt? And, uh, I mean, if you look at from that way, you are able to explain, for instance, Japan, which has a very high debt to GDP, but the debt burden there, I would argue, is not as high as debt to GDP per se suggests because interest on this debt is relatively low, so interest payment to revenue looks more reasonable. But if you have a high debt to GDP, you're obviously very susceptible to changes in the interest you pay on your debt. So this has to be kept in mind. Uh, the vulnerability for Japan to an increase in yield is quite high, given that debt to GDP is so Okay, so what we do in our publications is, 
we have on the x-axis that to GDP and on the y-axis which is inverse interest payment to revenue and then we have this debt trajectories and you can pretty nicely see how combinations of interest payment to revenue and debt to GDP evolve over time. And here we have four countries. I mean, first of all, why did we invert the scale? It's just we, we often argue that a country flies high in this space or loses creditworthiness, and so we thought it's more intuitive to have an inverted scale here. So if, if you go down here, which is for all triple A's the case uh, currently, then you lose creditworthiness, so you're falling down below uh, a certain level. But actually, I mean, it's, it's a rising interest payment to revenue here. Okay, I picked four countries here. Three of them are European. One is uh, uh, from the Western Hemisphere. Canada um, did a great job in the 90s. They started from that to GDP, or they, they went up to uh, more than 100, and then they were able to bring debt to GDP down, and even more so interest payment to revenue. Italy, Spain, Belgium, also very successful examples. But now the, the caveat comes. This was at a time where first uh, economic growth in most, in the second half of the 90s, economic growth was supportive to debt adjustments, and secondly, uh, interest, interest um, rates came down at that time. And both obviously gives you a lot of background. And uh, I mean, we are not, uh, Moody's is not a forecaster per se for interest rates and, and, and growth rates, uh, but uh, it's, uh, our expectations are more that we enter a low growth environment. It's pretty straightforward given that we have to exit from an expansionary monetary policy, we have to exit from uh, expansionary fiscal policy, and that um, interest rates sooner or later will go up from the extraordinary low levels that we currently uh, experience. And this is shown by this chart. You can see that uh, <laughs> debt to GDP in the 90s went down in OECD countries, but obviously this was induced to some extent at least from a decline in the long-term interest rate. And now we are here. That is rising fastly and it's not to be expected that there will be um, uh, additional support from even lower interest rates. I mean, they cannot go down from where we are today. They can go up in general terms if you look at uh, bonds or U.S. Treasuries. And then you have in addition the issue of uh, spreads that are widening for countries that uh, are uh, that are challenged whether their uh, debt is sustainable. The long term has become much nearer. This shows you the euro area public debt projection under no policy change assumption. And the um, green line are the 2006 projections, so looks awful. But 2009 looks even more awful. I mean, it looks pretty much the same. It's just shifted. It's just shifted. It's just shifted by 20 to 25 years. This means the challenges in the future that are stemming from age-related cost rents will hit us 20 to 25 years earlier. So we lost a lot of time uh, due to the crisis, and this makes... Um, adds to the challenge regarding public finances. Market perception of some countries has changed. Rating agencies' perception of some countries has changed. Um, but markets tend to overreact. I mean, uh, just two years ago, we were challenged um, that our rating was too low regarding Greece. You can see two things here. The green line is the Moody's rating in the A category. And the bond implied rating is the rating that's implied by bond yields, bond spreads.
And you can see that not that long ago, in uh, 2009, the market yield suggested a high double A rating. And people asked us, are you sleeping on the deck? I mean, this, it's an EMU country, and we have convergence everywhere. They're growing. They're easily financeable. The ECB is behind them. So why is it just rated A and not a high double A? OK. And now we're challenged from the other side, <laughs> asked, how can you have an investment grade rating for a country where 70% of market participants, according to a Bloomberg poll, uh, say that uh, debt restructuring is inevitable and very likely. The counter-offensive has started. So there is no alternative to fiscal consolidation in the countries that are in focus. And, um, and here you can see the primary balance announcements from the countries. 2009, this is an, uh, an actual number. And then uh, what they forecast in their stability programs. And um, as to be expected, all countries reach at least a debt stabilizing primary balance by 2013. Yeah. I mean, that's what you expect from a government to produce uh, a plan that will stabilize debt. The interesting question will be, are the countries able to deliver on these plans? And, uh, and here there are obviously uh, countries with a promising track record and others with without a track record or with a weak track record, record where, I mean, there are certainly countries in the EMU periphery where we need a structural break to the better uh, in, in order to make that uh, sustainable <coughs> in the medium term. Um, important economic growth, this is our view. Um, economic gro growth by its own will not be able to solve the issues in the Eurozone. Um, large AAA governments, too, are vulnerable to a rise in their cost of funding. OK, the focus is at these days very much on Europe and, uh, and, and obviously triggered a bit by the uh, unclear communication and, and, and all the mechanisms that are just made up now in the crisis and, uh, and uh, maybe a bit of lack of political leadership as well and so on. But if you look, look at the gross figures at debt maturity and so on, uh, the US has a big issue here as well, which may hit uh, uh, in the medium term. Tail risk remains substantial. Policy errors can quickly complicate an already delicate debt equation. Uh, Obviously, uh, not the Greece crisis was not perfectly handled, and uh, the nervousness of the markets was just shown in the case of Hungary, for instance, where uh, the new Fidesz government made um, statements that were meant to some extent to, um, to the domestic audience, but which uh, made uh, the markets very nervous so that they had to make a U-turn uh, over the weekend back then. And um, it's interesting. In the past, there was a lot of talk about monetary expectations and the need to anchor monetary expectations. And now it's really the need to anchor fiscal expectations. I mean, this is key to it, that, that, that you are able to convince market participants that uh, that the fiscal expectations are anchored and that you are able to deliver not on your monetary targets but on your, on, on, on your fiscal targets. And, and this will make the divide. And, 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 this, and this ability to really convince the market that you are able to anchor uh, those fiscal expecta uh, expectations then really drives the uh, liquidity uh, issue, which is so key now. Okay, this is the final part of this uh, uh, short uh, talk. Um, this is our AAA sovereign monitor framework. Uh, 
Um, again, you're familiar already with the chart on the x-axis, horizontal axis, debt to GDP, y-axis, uh, interest payment to revenues. And this is what I meant by uh, a loss in credit version is you have a, a debt trajectory that goes to the downside. And um, I mean, it's pretty difficult. Market participants want us to be transparent and predictable. But sovereign credit version is, is a very complex uh, issue, obviously. And we have a sovereign bond methodology, which is public, which um, uh, focuses on four factors. It's economic strengths, institutional strengths, government financial strengths, and susceptibility to event risk. And here with the AAA sovereign monitor, we seek to be as transparent as possible. And we say that for the AAA governments, we don't have major issues with economic strengths, nor with institutional strengths, and susceptibility to event risk should be very low by definition, more or less. So we can really focus on the third factor, which is government financial strengths. And government financial strengths with uh, AAA countries is more or less interest payment to revenue. If you have an emerging market, there are additional factors like uh, uh, to what extent is, uh, is, is the debt FX denominated, uh, are there external debt uh, risks and so on. But the assumption here is we can really abstract to a large extent from these other factors and we can really look at interest payment to revenue. And, um, and the idea is then really that um, if we should come to a point where we had to downgrade a triple A country, markets would not be completely shocked. To, but that they, we seek to be predictable. Yeah? Um, and in order to be predictable, we had to set up a certain mark. And, 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 and the mark, we looked at historical experiences, um, how um, ratings moved in the past. I mean, this is another issue when you do sovereign rating. If you have corporate ratings and so on, you have a lot of data points and you have defaults and everything. In the sovereign world, a lot of our discussions are philosophical because I mean, not many investment grades uh, countries have defaulted. I mean, even Iceland has not. So um, it's, you, don't, you cannot prove, but, um, but we looked at rating movements in the past and we looked at, uh, at defaults that we had in the non-investment grade and we are out with the 10% interest payment to revenue mark is a mark. If you go above 10%, then the policy choices that are to be made are under a certain constraint. And that would lead even with very high economic strengths, very high institutional strengths, very low susceptibility to renders, that leads to downward pressure on the rating. Uh, and uh, uh, another reason why we went for this framework is really our efforts are also that we, we don't want to go for easy targets. You know? We want to have the same framework for all countries. And, um, um, and obviously, large countries have additional features that make them more credit worthy than smaller countries. But beyond that, we don't want to go for, I guess, from market perception, I'm not sure about it, but it's probably easier to downgrade a small country than, say, US, Germany, or UK. And we won't really have to, same framework applying for all countries. And, we felt that to be able to make tough decisions if needed, we have to have uh, a consistent framework at least. Okay. Um, here we have country A, um, typical country in a way, through the crisis, debt to GDP increases, interest payment to revenue increases, and then we have a debt reversibility band. I mean, we don't want to be overly mechanistic and we give them the benefit of a doubt. And uh, I'm happy uh, to send you our AAA sovereign monitor. Just send me an email and, um, and I will send it to you. And there you will see we define this debt reversibility band differently for uh, different countries. So we give the US, uh, due to their shock absorption capacity and, and all the features that this economy has, um, a 4% debt reversibility band. And uh, Nordic countries, about 3% and uh, more vulnerable countries, uh, lower debt reversibility band. And if you go below this band, then, I mean, not an automatic downgrade, but uh, 
then there is certainly downward pressure on the rating and, uh, and markets should expect that uh, at some time a negative rating action may follow. Okay, these are the big fours, UK, US, France, Germany, different scenarios, blue line is the baseline, orange is the adverse, all trajectories look awful, all go down, and um, and some are touching even in the baseline go into this debt reversibility band. Okay, and in, in, in adverse scenario here assumptions are made weaker growth, uh, a weaker primary balance, higher yields, then uh, could be that um, this debt reversibility band is crossed and, and this would then trigger rating actions. Okay, conclusions. Uh, painful adjustment is needed, social cohesion is key, and this is something that we obviously monitor uh, uh, closely. Uh, I've been impressed by the measures that uh, have been undertaken by the Irish authorities and by the willingness uh, of the electorate here to go along with these measures, so this is a big, uh, a big plus in case of Ireland and uh, in other countries there are quite courageous efforts, but social cohesion is key here. Tail risk has increased, but um, can be contained. I mean, we were quite right on our calls regarding the ECB. We, we thought that it, it's, um, it's unlikely that a central bank would really withdraw liquidity from a member country. I mean, this is... Uh, uh, if there are solvency issues, the ECB cannot help. If there are liquidity uh, issues, then the, uh, even the ECB with her Bundesbank tradition and everyone at the end was forced uh, to provide uh, the, the appropriate liquidity. Sovereign ratings remain based on medium-term solvency assessment. Otherwise, I mean, it's uh, liquidity risk play a role through our factor four, but uh, in the end, we have to assess to a large extent, solvency medium to long term, because otherwise it gets all circular. Compression of time, this is uh, the argument that the curve just has shifted. Um, and um, I mean, the, the, the really challenging issues are these low probability, high uh, impact event risks, uh, in, in case of Ireland, for instance, um, the banking system, and, uh, and, and here we um, communication is we just include them if these are plausible scenarios if if they are possible scenarios that's not enough uh, at this stage our triple a governments remain well positioned as you know uh, all triple a's currently have a stable outlook but um, um, obviously based on the charts uh, that I showed um, uh, time is running short for some credits, and uh, and this assessment can change. Okay, I'll leave it there for the moment. Thank you. <clears throat>